I think the two-state solution uh, lies in the morgue for the last 10 years. Every now and then someone comes and takes the body, puts some life into it, dons it with some clothes, and say, oh, it's still alive, uh, and then it dies again, and it, it's getting back to the morgue. Uh, nobody dares to invite us to the funeral, because everybody is afraid that once we will all participate in the funeral of the two-state solution, we will have to say something we will say after uh, dinner tonight, so what is the alternative? So people don't like to talk about the alternative, so they keep this body in the morgue uh, as long as it can, as they did with Ariel Sharon. The reason the two-state solution is dead is because there is a logic political development within the state of Israel. Uh, people talk about the shift in Israel to the right. People talk about dramatic changes in the Israeli political system because of the 1967 war. But actually, the present political atmosphere, the present political culture in Israel, is a natural consequence of the nature of Zionism. Zionism is a settler colonialist movement. And some of you come from settler colonialist states. I don't know you, but I guess because there are very few countries which were not in the West, not born as settler colonialists. But in Palestine, settler colonialism appeared late in the day compared to other places. And it was a more unique case of settler colonialism. We have to admit, uh, taking into account the Jewish problem in Europe and the wish of the West to, prob to solve the Jewish problem through supporting the Zionist settler colonialism project in Palestine, and, of course, after the Holocaust, nobody wanted to face uh, Jewish settler colonialism, or even call it colonialism or settler colonialism, because it was the easiest way to close a very unpleasant chapter in the history uh, of Europe. Now, what is the nature of settler colonialism? Settler colonialism looks at natives and indigenous people, and the Palestinians are the indigenous native people of Palestine. They look at them as an obstacle for creating a safe homeland for the settlers. Look at the partition plan in 1947 that was mentioned here. In 1947, the Jews were one-third of the population. Most of them came three years before. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them. It was the only place in the world where the United Nations could come and say to the native indigenous people, you should partition your homeland and give almost 50% to a group of settlers who came three years before. It was never offered in any other place in the world. Definitely not in the at political atmosphere we had after the Second World War. The part that the, the world played in legitimizing the colonization of, of Palestine and the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in 1948 is very important. But it is history, I agree. It is history in the sense that there are certain established facts you have to live with. You can, as an historian, come back to them and say what you want to say about it. You can have a moral judgment about it. You can have uh, your views about it. But certain facts are an established facts in the sense that they are irreversible. They are irreversible. There is a third generation of Jewish settlers in the state. They still regard, like any typical settler colonialist movement, they regard the natives as aliens themselves, which is also very typical to settler colonialist movement. If you look at the first, uh, the first impressions of Zionist settlers, even the second aliyah, the second wave of immigration, they already call the Palestinians aliens in their own homeland. So there is a, a kind of a settler colonialist DNA in Israel in the treatment and perception of the Palestinians, which is very natural to a settler colonialist state. Now, settler colonialist state is also a modern state and has to adapt to changes circumstances. And definitely the means by which you substantiate the, the, or you solidify your control over the land change over time, definitely. And one of the best means from a pragmatic point of view for a settler colonialist state to survive is to offer partition, for instance. 
if you don't have the capacity to control all the coveted land, if you insist of also being a democratic settler colonialist state, namely you want really to show that the majority determines the policy, you have to make sure that the natives are always a minority within the electorate. Israel made sure that for the first elections in 1949, one million Palestinians who were supposed to be part of the Jewish state would not be there at the day of the election by expelling them and by not allowing those who left to return. So this notion that I can be both a settler colonialist state, namely a Jewish state, and a democratic state is the main consensual approach of all the Zionist parties. They have tactical disagreements of how to achieve it. Now, in 1967 created, and I don't get got in getting into the question, why did the 1967 war erupt? We can talk about it later. But it's very clear that 1967 created both an opportunity and a conundrum to the settler state. It had all the coveted land under its power because of the circumstances that the war created. But after expelling one million Palestinians, it incorporated another million and a half Palestinians. And that this balance between demography and geography, within the number of people and then the space or the amount of kilo, uh, square kilometers, is all the, pre, the main preoccupation of Zionist parties in Israel. How can you have the land without the people? Now, sometimes you can have the land without the people by kicking the people out. Sometimes you can have the land without the people by not allowing the people to move out, as they do now in the West Bank. You don't allow them to move out of the villages. You tell the people of Jerusalem who lived in neighborhoods for years that their neighborhoods are actually West Bank villages. The, the, the Zionist mind is quite genius when it comes to solving the conundrum I want to have Palestine, but I don't want to have the Palestinians in it. From my, from my perception, from an Israeli consensual perception, the two-state solution is a tactical solution to the problem of how to have the land without having the people. And this is why I think it's true that from the Israeli perspective, Oslo was not about the two-state solution. Oslo was about autonomy, was about creating Mantu stands for the Palestinians, because then you can have those parts of the West Bank which you want, but you don't have to give citizenship to the Palestinians, uh, and they can, maybe they will be happy in these Mantu stands, maybe they will be happy in those enclaves, but it turned out that they were not happy in those enclaves. So, because I have one, one minute, I would say the following. If after 50 years of support of the most powerful international actors, after the support of the United Nations for 50 years for the same solution, if, just from a commonsensical point of view, if not only this international consensus, that in this international support did not create, not only did it not create a two-state solution, it made the situation far worse on the ground, it is really time to think about a new solution. But probably, as long as nobody admits that there is a morgue and a body, and there's no funeral, and there's no closure for the tragedy of the death of the two-state solution, we will never have a genuine discussion of the alternatives. Thank you.